and welcome to Family Focus. I'm Pastor Bob Bainey, and the topic that we'll be looking at today is, Why Can't My Child Read? If you were to look at the bottom 25% of children in a school class, you would find that 75% of them have some type of eye coordination problem. Unfortunately, many of these children are labeled as learning disabled or having some other kind of problem, a problem child, and they're shipped off to special education classes. We want to look at this issue of uh, eye coordination problems uh, and uh, how these are not necessarily learning disability problems or problem children. To help me do that is Dr. Daniel uh, Nast, who is a specialist in developmental optometry and who does specialize in these types of things. We're glad to have you with us and glad to be able to have the opportunity to discuss this very important issue. Uh, we're going to do that. First, we'll take a break uh, and then we'll be right back. Dr. Nast, uh, you are a developmental optometrist. I've never even heard of the term. Uh, I do know that you've been practicing in the field of optometry for about 30 years here in the Melrose Park, uh, Illinois area, and that you're a pioneer in this field. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into the field and what that field is? Well, it's not really a new field. It's just that we are looking at these individuals from a different standpoint. We're starting to practice holistic optometry. We are looking at a total individual rather than just a pair of eyeballs. Uh, we're getting away from the old terminology of 2020 is perfect vision. Uh, 2020 never was perfect vision. There is no such thing as 2020 vision. There is 2020 sight, which is a quantity measurement. Now, when we take that stimulation and run it back through the cortex, the visual cortex of the brain, and we react on it either as a spoken word or some type of motor function, this total process is vision. So sight is a very small part of vision. If it was an important part of it, all of our nearsighted students would be the bottom of the class because they can't see. Mm -hmm. But they're not, they're the top of the class. So sight per se has very little to do with learning. So what we are trying to do is to take these youngsters who have the potential, who are not working up to their potential, and finding out why they can't do it. And we are doing this in many different ways. So there is a difference between sight and vision. Sight well, is, is, you know, the light comes in, you're able to see, but vision is, is being able to understand what you're seeing and to correlate it in your mind and to use it. Exactly mm -hmm. right. Uh, sight is a quantity measure. Mm -hmm. Vision can be a quality measure. Okay. Because the way the coordination between the two eyes works will affect our vision, may not affect our sight. This is one of the fallacies with some of our school screening. Mm -hmm. What do they do? How far down on the chart can you read? Oh, you got 20, 20, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Has <clears throat> nothing to do with reading. And, and, and we're talking really about a very serious issue in our schools and in our families today because there are uh, so many children out there that have these eye coordination problems. <clears throat> and they're being labeled as learning disabled or something else, but the real cause of the problem isn't being uh, found and treated. Well, that's true. Uh, let me put it in a little different context. Uh, before we can learn to read, we ha before we can read to learn, we really have to learn to read. Mm -hmm. That's pretty basic. Sure. Now, even before we learn to read, we need certain skills. We have to be able to turn our eyes into a page, otherwise we see double. This is called convergence. We have to focus on this page, otherwise the printer we're looking at is blurred. So the turning in of our eyes and the focusing of our eyes have to work together. And very often with these youngsters that are having problems with reading, these two skills, these two very basic skills are not working together. And what we are doing with either lenses or with visual therapy is getting these two skills to work together and they automatically will improve their ability to function up to their potential. Is there basically one 
type of malfunction or eye coordination problem we're talking about here, or are there a variety of them uh, with some? No, there are many different varieties of them. Uh, we can have, we can run the gamut. We can have an eye that turns in, where a, a person is eliminating one eye. This is their way of survival. We can have youngsters who are becoming nearsighted. This is their way of surviving. Nature will do everything in her power not to have us see double. Mm -hmm. Even to the point of turning an eye in or turning an eye up or down or in or out. Or taking away our distant sight. Because about 85% of what a student learns, they learn by reading. And show me a student doesn't read and I'll show you a student doesn't learn. Mm -hmm. And if they can't read efficiently, they cannot learn up to their potential. And that's what we're talking about. And what's happening in this child's life is he doesn't understand why he's having trouble reading. Mom and dad can't understand why their child isn't doing well in school. Exactly. Uh, maybe a teacher or somebody else has said, well, this child must be learning disabled. And the child probably concludes he's just plain stupid. You got it. And you have frustration. Absolutely. <clears throat> because in our schools, our schools are there to educate our youngster. Why they cannot learn is not their prerogative. This is not what they're there for, to diagnose these things. Mm -hmm. They know that either a youngster is able to perform at grade level or he isn't. If he doesn't, there is only one place for them to put him, either two places. They can either retain him in school a grade level or they put them in special ed. There is nothing else. And this is missing the whole problem. There are so many youngsters that are in special ed that really don't belong there, but there's no other place to put them. Well, these statistics that I got from some information that you had sent to us, uh, if you were to look at the 25%, the lowest 25% in the class, the reason there may very well be in that low 25% is because 75% of them are having some kind of eye coordination problem. Absolutely. And this, this has been <coughs> documented through research at the university level. So we're, it's not just figures that we're picking out of thin air. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is what has gone on. And until we get into a better screening program in our schools, we're going to continue to foster this same type of program mm -hmm. that uh, if they don't perform, then we put them in special ed. Uh, the diagnosis of hyperactivity, the daydreamer, all of these things are symptoms of something else not functioning. And, and, and the joy of the story is that you've shared with me uh, as we talked in preparation for the program that, that uh, so many times uh, someone like you has been able to take a child who's failing in school, who's frustrated, who can't read, who doesn't understand, and in three, four months, turn that whole situation around and have a child that's passing and maybe getting very good, excellent grades. Well, you know, <clears throat> it, it gets very emotional because unless you have lived with a youngster who is having this kind of a problem, you don't know what it's all about. Right. Uh, and I think that this is part of the problem with some of the doctors. They just haven't been close enough to it. My son is 31 now, and uh, when he was in first grade, he was diagnosed as a learning disability. Going back 25 years ago, I said, fine, what is this? Mm -hmm. Well, here's a book, go home and read about it. And uh, it was very unsatisfactory because it told me nothing. No one had any answers as to what a learning disability was. So we, I started to go back into our literature in optometry. And back in the 1920s, this was all spelt out by some of our writers in those days and starting to correlate it and starting to work with my son and the rest of the people that have had this kind of a problem, we have finally come with, with some of the answers. Not all of them. No one field has all the answers on learning disabilities. Right. But we are to able to diagnose these youngsters that we can help. And it's amazing how some of these families have just been torn apart. Where do I go? Nobody gives me an answer. Nobody tells me what's wrong. And nobody helps. And nobody helps. They've We've gone to the neurologist, the psychologist, uh, the, their family physician. 
Nobody looks the total youngster. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're trying to do, and this is why I said we're starting to practice holistic optometry. We've got some clips of some of the types of therapy that you use that uh, really almost miraculously turn these people around in just a couple of months. Why don't we pause and take a look at a couple of those, and you can explain to us what's going on. Okay, we can do that, sure. Now, what do we have here? Uh, here is a, a patient who has had difficulty reading, and what we are starting to do here is trying to smooth out her eye movements. And these are called saccadic fixations, and they are the movements that we have to go through reading across the line of a print. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that because it's vitally important in, able, in being able to expand a person's knowledge. But we're trying to smooth out her, her eye movements so that they're not a jerky. Which is the movement. part of the problem that she's having. That's exactly right. She this comes is her in. way of trying to cope with it. What's going on there? Now here, what we are trying to do here is to develop binocularity or the ability to use both eyes at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've heard of lazy eyes and this is one of the ways that we have of trying to correct that condition. The patient that's sitting here is seeing a picture with one eye and that is projected on the yellow paper and then she is tracing it. So in order to trace it she has to be using both eyes at the same time which is the purpose of the whole training mm -hmm. is to get her to do that. This is another form of a very similar thing. Instead of tracing it she is matching numbers and in order to do that some numbers are on one card and some on the other. And here is developing hand-eye coordination. This has an audio counter that when he gets off the mark or off the maze, it counts. So that we have an efficiency uh, means of keeping track of how well he is doing. Less mistakes. Less mistakes. Mm -hmm. The more efficient he is, the better the hand-eye coordination. The better the hand-eye coordination, the better he's going to function. And it's amazing, even with some of these youngsters, how we have gotten some of these kids who could never ride a bike. After therapy, they can now ride a bike because they're better coordinated. Mm -hmm. I think there's some. This is uh, uh, the Brock string is what it's called. And this is teaching binocularity. Our therapist here, Mrs. Puccio, is training this youngster to use both eyes at the same time and moving the marker further out into space so that he is able to expand his field of seeing. And it works beautifully, and this is just part of what we are doing. Here we are practicing also hand-eye coordination and developing hand-eye movement. Uh, a light goes on, and then he has to press that before another light goes on at random. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, some of these youngsters can actually f remember the pattern. Figure the pattern and out. You'll see here he's he's got the pattern. Here we're teaching directionality, uh, because in this country we read from left to right, and a lot of these youngsters do not know left from right, top to bottom. And we can teach directionality here, and it works out beautifully. A therapist also, is calling out numbers, right, and he's she'll, drawing. She'll say. Uh, one to five, two to four, this type of thing. Here we are training where something is in space because we want these youngsters further out. The tendency of all of, most of these youngsters is to pull their whole world in close to them. And this is what we're trying to do. And you'll notice that we're using a golf ball because if they miss it, they're going to get hit in the nose. Right on the nose. And they don't miss it very often. So that is... Uh, and it really works. That is uh, uh, motivation to make sure you hit exactly the golf ball. Exactly right. Exactly right. And here's trying to draw two circles at the same time. Here, it, this is very difficult in that we are trying to get both hands to work in unison. And you'll notice that one is leading the other. They should be both going the same time. There is also an auditory response here that when she gets off the black mark, there's it, a record. There's of a it. record of it. Sure. So we can also see efficiency of this, and it's just amazing. These are the types of things that we can develop 
piecemeal and then we put it all together where we're ending up teaching visualization because if you can't visualize you can't read this is a walking beam and here again we are developing body coordination and if you cannot see where your feet are you can't walk on a walking beam you notice he's doing cross walking here this is very difficult because he has to know where his feet are. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't know where they are, Jan is there to grab him because he's going to fall flat sure, on his face. Sure, and he's doing that with his eyes closed. That's right, because I want him to visualize where his feet are. This is what, this is, again, we are teaching visualization mm -hmm. because we know that if you can't visualize, you can't read efficiently. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. And I've had some of these youngsters where they cannot actually stand on a walking beam. Here we are again developing smoother eye mo movements. We're using a Marsden ball. There are letters on there, and he's trying to pick out letters. Now, if you talk about concentration, this takes a great deal of concentration all the way through. So his eyes would have to follow that ball around, in, working together, working. and then focus in in order to to see the numbers. Right. We, we've got to take a break. That was very interesting. Uh, and we'll uh, come back and talk more about okay. this. We'll be back in just a moment. Dr. Nast, what, what I'd like to do now <clears throat> is look at uh, several more clips that show us some of the testing devices you use uh, when you're testing young children that, that come to you with these types of problems and that also show uh, some of the kinds of improvement that can be made over even six and seven weeks, mm -hmm. uh, which is about half, uh, half of a program's length, if I understand. Well, we don't have any set program because each individual is an individual. One, one individual, may, we may be able to clear him up in uh, three weeks. Somebody mm -hmm. else may take three months. Mm -hmm. Depending on the severity of the case, somebody may take even longer than that. Sure. There is no set pattern, and we don't do the same thing with each individual. Okay, well, let's take a look okay. at, at what we do have here, and you can uh, explain to us what they are all about. One of the problems we have is explaining to the parent where the problem is. I can tell you that your son or daughter has a learning disability and their directionality is not right and their accommodation is faulty. What have I said? You said a lot of big words. Right, that I don't, yeah, it right. means nothing. Right. But this way, this is called the Van Orden uh, binocular pattern. It shows us the way both eyes are working. The top one will show that the right eye is coming to a point focus. The left eye, which is the other side, is almost parallel, which is an indication of not using one eye, suppressing the sight in one eye. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this is the groundwork that we have laid before we start. Now, as we go through therapy, we better darn well see an improvement in this condition. And is that what we're seeing here, now, the, the, the top one? one the second, that's the top one. Mm -hmm. That's our starting point. That's the first point. one. Right. Halfway through our therapy, or thereabouts, after a period of three or four weeks or whatever it is, we will take another one to see if there is improvement. Mm -hmm. The second one starts to show us where the left eye is already starting to come in. It's coming to a point focus, which is what we're after, which means at this point, he is starting to use both eyes at the same time. The third one is the final one, and this is where we ended up. Mm -hmm. And this is, if I had seen the third one, at the same time I saw the first one, we never would have done therapy because they wouldn't have needed it. Right, right. So this is corrective work as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. We are trying to correct the condition. Once you correct it, we eliminate it, and he has no problem. Sure, and you can see the tremendous uh, improvement there. Yes. Let's take a look at the next one. This is a reading uh, this test. This is also a this is a reading efficiency test. Mm -hmm. This also now a parent can understand this. In the top, in the first one, he is reading the first three paragraphs on the left side in so many seconds and making so many mistakes. The next three paragraphs are the left eye, the next three paragraphs are the right eye, and the third one, or the fourth one, on the one on the right side, is both eyes again. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when we get all through, we better darn well see an improvement in his speed, and we better darn well see an improvement in his number of mistakes. In this particular but, test that, that we're looking at, too, as we looked at that ahead of time, you pointed out that uh, the pretest, as he first came in for, for testing, there was, you know, it took him 120 seconds or something to read that, and there was 20 some mistakes. Right. And in the last one, when the program was completed, he read it in 115 seconds, and there was no, no mistakes. Now, a, a parent looking at this can say, I can understand. Mm -hmm. Now, I can see where there is improvement in my son's reading efficiency. This is really what it's about. Sure. Because when we get all through therapy, if we haven't helped this youngster in school, we've wasted wasn't worth a lot it. of time. Sure. It wasn't worth it. Sure. Let's look at the, uh, the last clip that we have. And I believe that this is a comparison uh, from the same student writing the same story. Right. And on the right-hand side is the way he wrote that story when he came in for treatment. And he is about halfway through his treatment program now, and he has just written the one on the left side. Right. And so you can see the improvement that has been made. Now, I must emphasize this. I don't teach writing. I don't teach reading in right. my office. Right. All that I am doing is trying to give these youngsters the skills that they need so they can perform up to their potential in school. If I can give them these skills, the reading and the writing is going to improve by itself. Right. Okay. If I'm, a, if I'm a parent and I have a child and I've been told he's a problem child or she is or uh, that child has a learning disability and I suspect or I want to make sure it's not an eye coordination problem, uh, where do I go? This I hear all the time. How do I know that the doctor that I am going to is the right doctor? The first thing that he has to do is to make a series of near point examinations. This is vitally important because these youngsters are using their eyes at their reading distance. What they see across the room is relatively unimportant. Mm -hmm. Second of all, will I know what the doctor is talking about? Can he explain it to me so I can understand? And any time a doctor cannot explain what he is doing and why he is doing it, there's something wrong. Will I get a written report from this doctor that I can understand, and will he see him again for a reevaluation? Now, there's a lot of doctors that will say, well, I don't do this, or I don't do that, or I don't do something else. Or they will say, yes, I do it, but when you boil it all down, how is it going to affect their ability to read and perform in school? This is really what it's all about. And it's a very difficult thing. Do, we, do we, doctors we, identify themselves as developmental optometrists? Some of us do. There are two organizations that we use that are national organizations. One is the College of Optometrist and Vision Development. They are in Chula Vista, California. That's their home office. The other one is the Optometric Extension Program. They are also in California. And a note to any one of these two and they will tell you who in your area does this kind of work. Good. And I noticed that um, uh, you had brought along some pamphlets uh, that describe these various types of problems, and certainly uh, doctors that are um, into this field and looking at it the way you are would probably have that kind of information around their offices and so forth, too. Right. Uh, because that's what they're into. That's right. I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. I think this is uh, such an important problem. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing this show is because there happens to be a family in our congregation, my congregation, who, who had that problem. You know that person. Uh, I know. And the child was having so much uh, difficulty and I shared in some of their frustration and uh -huh. and uh, now after the treatment uh, program and so forth things are so much better and that's that's the kind of blessing so I want to thank you we've got to go our time is up we thank you for being with us we remind you as always that all those that are in Christ are new creations we thank you for watching we'll see you next time on Family Focus mm -hmm.